Hello, uh, good morning everyone and welcome to today's HIV briefing developed in partnership with the Lanarkshire Blood Bone Virus Network and Scottish Drugs Forum. My name is Trish Toker and I am the Blood Bone Virus Network Manager with NHS Lanarkshire and I will be chairing today's session. The COVID pandemic has caused the most significant disruption many of us will ever have experienced and challenges to the way that we all live and challenges to the way health and community systems are provided. In today's webinar, we will be focusing on the HIV outbreak in Glasgow and the impact this has had on the spread of HIV in Lanarkshire. We will be learning about HIV transmission, prevention and treatment, and hearing about how the coronavirus pandemic and lockdown has resulted in specific challenges for people who inject drugs and challenges this has presented for service provision as well. You can see from the programme today that the speakers, that we have a range of speakers who will be joining us. And I will introduce each in turn and invite them to say a little more about themselves before they start the presentation. Today's briefing is divided into two sessions, each lasting approximately 40 minutes, with a short break between both. We will also have a question and answer session at the end of the final presentation in each of the sessions. And you're invited as attendees to submit questions throughout the webinar. The questions tab appears on the control panel, which should be down the right hand side of your screen. During the question and answer session, I will invite Maureen Woods to join us on screen to facilitate the question and answer session. Maureen will be also be presenting uh, after the break. So without further ado, I would like to invite Leslie Bond onto the screen. And Leslie's from Scottish Drugs Forum. She'll say a wee bit more about herself and invite Leslie to, uh, to do the first presentation for us, which is about HIV. Over you go, Leslie. Thank you, and thank you for having me today. Um, as Trish said, my name is Leslie Bond. I'm a national training and development worker for the Scottish Drugs Forum. One of my key roles is to deliver training on bloodborne viruses. So today I'm going to be delivering some slides and a bit of a session on HIV. So we're going to do an introduction to HIV. So first of all, I think it's really important just to get to grips with the basics. So HIV is a virus, but what is a virus? A virus is a very, very simple infectious agent. It's a piece of genetic code, DNA or RNA, surrounded by a cell wall. And a virus's main job is to make more copies of itself, but it cannot do this by itself. It needs other cell types to use components of those other cells in order to make more copies of itself and to make more virus. And there are lots and lots of different types of viruses that infect many, many different types of cells. So some other human cells, plant cells, animal cells, and even bacteria cells. Um, but we're here today to talk about HIV. So HIV infects immune system cells. So HIV, as I said, is a virus. It infects cells of the immune system, and it uses those immune system cells to make more copies of itself. HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus. When HIV makes copies of itself, it does this using the immune system cells and over time our immune system becomes what we might call deficient or harmed or just not as good as if we didn't have HIV. This is without treatment. So without treatment, this leads to the onset of what we might call AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, and we also may refer to that now as late stage HIV infection. Another really important important point just to consider and just to take on board is it's HIV, the virus that is infectious. It is not AIDS, the syndrome, the end stage disease result of living with HIV, the virus, and not having access to treatment. So we do not pass AIDS from one person to another. It is HIV, the virus that can be transmitted from one person to another. So AIDS, as I said, AIDS stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. And AIDS is the collection of specific illnesses and conditions which occur when our immune system has been compromised or made deficient and had damage done to it by the HIV virus. As the HIV virus uses cells of the immune system over time to make more copies of itself, it damages our immune system. Today, it is rare for someone to die as a result of an AIDS-defining illness in Scotland. However, historically in the 80s, 90s, many, many people did die as a result of AIDS and that legacy is still felt today. Um, 
so the learning that we are here today that it, it, HIV and AIDS does does not need to result in death or HIV infection does not mean death today in, in Scotland. The two main reasons why someone today in Scotland may die as a result of their HIV infection is either they have been diagnosed late, so therefore they didn't know that they had the infection and they did not um, have a chance to take treatment, or for other reasons, they are unable or choose not to take treatment. So HIV prevalence. Um, there's just over about five and a half thousand people living and diagnosed with HIV in Scotland today. And about three quarters of that are male and one quarter are female. Just under 10% of people living with HIV, so about another 10% on top of that five and a half thousand are considered or thought to be undiagnosed in Scotland today living with HIV. And about 500 people in total live with HIV in Lanarkshire. Most people in Scotland living today in, um, with HIV in Scotland will have acquired HIV through, se through sex. Um, so transmission of HIV. HIV is found to be infectious in body fluids, um, five, five different body fluids. So three of those could be considered sexual fluids, so the genital fluids, vaginal fluid, semen, and moisture within the rectum. All three of them can, can contain HIV at quantities that if those fluids got into the body of another person, HIV could be passed on from to the other person. HIV is considered as a bloodborne virus, so it's also found in the blood as well. That's primarily the route for injecting drug use. It's blood, um, blood from a needle and goes into the vein of another person. And HIV is also found to be in quantities known to be infectious in breast milk as, in breast milk as well. Um, and one of the prevention methods for that would be um, prescribed formula milk from the NHS. So in Scotland, HIV is most often transmitted by unprotected anal, vaginal or oral sex, by the sharing of injecting equipment and from mother to baby during pregnancy, birth or breastfeeding. So the previous slide, when we were talking about transmission and the main routes of transmission, an important point to consider is that those transmission routes are without access to treatment. Because treatment has come such a long way, and we'll talk more about what treatment is in the second presentation that I deliver later on today. But we have this new body of evidence and this new way of talking about um, HIV and transmission. So this is known as undetectable equals untransmittable or U equals U. Hopefully some of you have heard about this today. What this means is that because treatment for HIV is so good, a person living with HIV takes treatment. The treatment works to prevent the replication of the virus and the quantity of HIV in the body goes to so low, so low and at such low levels that our labs can't actually detect HIV in any quantity anymore. This isn't a cure, the person still has HIV in their body, it's just at such low levels, it is said to be undetectable, undetectable by the diagnostic machines. When the person gets their undetectable viral load result, it is then said that they are unable to transmit or pass HIV on to their sexual partners with or without using a condom or other prevention methods. So the chances of transmitting HIV from one person to another when the person living with HIV has an undetectable viral load through sex is zero. It is unable to be done. And there's lots and lots of studies for this. And there is lots of 20 years worth of the HIV community and doctors and people living with HIV as well, knowing this to be true. But we can now categorically state it as fact. So one of the studies, um, Terence Higgins Trust have created this nice infographic. Um, so one of the studies that show this to be the case um, was conducted in 14 European countries. 888 couples were recruited to a study. One of the couples would be HIV positive on treatment and with an undetectable viral load. And the other one of the couple would be HIV negative. They would be asked to have 
the sex that they would typically have, but record the sex that they were having. And there was 58,000 acts of sex without a condom and zero transmissions of HIV. So today, because treatment is so good, when we get people to undetectable viral load, we're preventing onward transmission to sexual partners. And this is huge for people living with HIV as well. So this is true for transmission via sex. We cannot say the same for injecting drug use or mother to child transmission, but we can say that if someone gets undetectable viral load, their odds of passing HIV on through either sharing injecting equipment or, um, not, or through um, childbirth and pregnancy is greatly, greatly reduced. So hopefully that made, um, that was clear. Um, so this slide here, we're just going to talk through some of the key prevention tools that we have for HIV. And the first one there is what we just discussed. When we give people treatment, it reduces the amount of virus in that person's body. So not only is it protecting that individual health, it is reducing the amount of virus that's available to be passed on to the community. So it's acting as community or public health prevention methods as well. So that's our U equals U, and that stands for undetectable equals untransmittable. So we get, give people access to very, very good treatment that's available today. We reduce the amount of virus in the person. There's then less virus to be passed on to others. So the second is the male and female condoms, a s absolute st um, staple in prevention methods for HIV, and also access to sterile injecting equipment. Both access to and um, using condoms and also injecting equipment, we need to ensure that those are both accessible and acceptable to the people that we want to use them as well. So we need to make sure that they're getting into the hands at highest risk of prevention of HIV. The next two prevention methods, number four and number five on the list there, pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis. Now the word prophylaxis, that means preventative treatment. So these are two med medications or treatments that people who are HIV negative can take to prevent them from becoming infected with HIV. And I'm going to go on and discuss those a little bit um, in more detail later on. We also have specialist um, midwifery teams um, to, in Lanarkshire. I believe you've got Louise Pollock and her team um, working with the management. So if they're working with a woman or a man who are HIV positive and they want to have a baby, they'll discuss the um, they'll discuss the pregnancy. They'll manage the birth based on viral load, and then they'll also give access to formula milk as well. And they'll work with the mother to ensure or to, that the baby's odds of becoming HIV positive are as low as possible. In Scotland, mother to child transmission is now considered to be near zero. It's not zero, but it's near zero. One of the big things that we hope that you take away from today, um, and my colleague Ross will talk more on this um, next, is the normalization of regular repeat testing. Early diagnosis really does save people's lives when it comes to HIV. And the more that we get into the routine of if people are at risk of accepting tests, but also if we're working with people at risk of offering and ensuring that that person is being tested routinely, repeatedly, and that they understand the risk. And we're also talking about the harm reduction when those negative results are coming in as well. The better it's going to be for everyone in terms of HIV within Lanarkshire. And everyone's watching today, so hopefully we're all learning some new things um, from all the speakers today in education. But we ask that you take that education on and we talk about it with colleagues or the clients that we're working with, because the more that people understand the new things such as U equals U, the advances in treatment, the different prevention methods we have, and also the fact that people living today with HIV, if they get access to the good treatment and early diagnosed, their life expectancy is typically the same as the general population. It is not what we used to have back in the um, 80s, 90s, early 2000s. We have come such a long way in terms of HIV today. And that education plays a big part in tackling stigma. 
So just a couple of points on the outbreak that has been um, ongoing in Glasgow since 2015. So amongst people who are homeless and also people who inject drugs, primarily within Glasgow city centre at the start, there was a large increase in HIV transmission and diagnosis ongoing between on that population since 2015. The, on, the transmission of HIV in that population is still ongoing. It is the largest outbreak of HIV amongst people who use drugs in the UK since the 1980s, and we've had over 170 diagnoses to date. The two main predictive factors for the outbreak have been homelessness and cocaine injecting. Cocaine injecting leads or stimulant injecting leads to higher bloodborne virus risk factors and also bacterial um, infections risk factors due to the fact that people are injecting more often during the day, typically not taking enough equipment away to ensure they've got sterile injecting equipment for all the injecting episodes that they have. They're more likely to share, therefore, if they don't have access to enough equipment. And stimulants also increases people's libido, so they're having more sex as well. So all of these reasons, bloodborne virus, HIV in particular, um, transmission has been increased because of um, cocaine injecting. And from 2015, it was very centred in the city centre of Glasgow and maybe just east of the city centre. But in the last few years, we have had pockets of additional um, cases in North Glasgow, Renfrewshire and also Lanarkshire. And those Lanarkshire cases that we've seen is why we're all here today. So there's lots of lessons to be learned from what um, Glasgow did. Um, but one of the most important is that services adapted to meet the needs of the people and the population at risk. And that really included things like outreach testing, outreach treatment as well, and lots of outreach support. Um, and that made that is making a difference in Glasgow. So I think for at the moment, that is me. So thank you very much, Trish. Thank you very much, Wesley. That was a, that was a tremendous presentation. I think you've covered a lot of very, very important facts. And bearing in mind that the, the, the webinar today is opened up to staff from across a range of services. So we will have people who will be listening who will be perhaps pretty expert in HIV, but we will also have a number of individuals who maybe haven't heard of HIV for a long time or they've maybe never sat through an education um, sort of session like this. And I think you've managed to really explain some really key facts in a really good way that everybody could understand and particularly good to see the, the importance as well of the role that treatment plays with regards to prevention is very important. And I know that that's something that you'll, you'll revisit. And really for all attendees, again, uh, for everyone watching, just to remind you, uh, about the, the questions at the side, and I'm sure there'll be already a lot of questions coming in uh, to Leslie. So I'd like to say thank you very much to Leslie. We'll certainly be seeing you again. Um, and invite Ross, uh, Ross Miller on screen. Hi, Ross, how are you? Hey, Trish, how are you doing? Good, good. Um, so I am just going to let Ross, Ross is, say a bit about himself in terms of his role and hand over to Ross, who's going to take us through uh, some more specific uh, um, issues around prevention and specifically around the impact of COVID and uh, inject injecting equipment provision services in Lanarkshire. Over to you, Ross. Yeah, that's great, Trish. Thanks for inviting me on. Uh, so, hi, every hi everyone. Uh, so, as you can see from the first slide there, I'm part of the harm reduction team. So, we're a small, uh, a small team. Uh, and we work with uh, people in a number of different ways. However, a lot of the focus is around work with people who inject drugs. And uh, as mentioned earlier, we are also part of the Lanarkshire Bloodborne Virus Network. So you can see for this slide, uh, I'm really going to be talking about bloodborne virus prevention, which Trish mentioned. And probably I'm going to talk probably for around about 10 minutes. And if we can move on to the next slide. So really, I want to give some perspective about where we are just now. Uh, and the fact that we're all uh, using the internet to, and we're not sitting in a room tells you a bit about where we are just now. So the impact of COVID-19 has been huge for the community who use injecting equipment provision. So 25th of March, Scottish Government uh, introduced lockdown. 
So the, I suppose what happened around that was, and we'll be familiar, there's certain people I would imagine will be familiar with some of the issues that arose to that. Uh, so pharmacies, uh, in response to the pandemic, like the rest of us had to all our practices. So part of that was about uh, restricted opening hours, not so many people in the pharmacies. And an outcome of that was long queues. And certainly people we work with were making reference to uh, being in the queue for the pharmacy, home to access injecting equipment and a member of staff coming out and asking them uh, in the queue, in public, what injecting equipment they were looking for. So you can imagine how people are kind of responding to that. So based on the, since lockdown in the same time frame uh, last year, at lockdown, injecting equipment provision across Scotland dropped roughly 30%. So people, were, people weren't accessing injecting equipment provision. Uh, so it's again and reflecting on the same time period last year. So that has increased and we're now sitting about 8% down on last year. Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of different implications from this, uh, people accessing injecting equipment. And the likelihood is uh, there's been a significant increase in uh, sharing injecting equipment and paraphernalia. Uh, and as uh, uh, Leslie mentioned earlier, that's a, that's a, real, uh, a real issue uh, around bloodborne virus risk transmission. So there's a, there's a real concern going on just now uh, across, well, certainly in Lanarkshire and across Scotland in general about how the impact of COVID is going to result. So responding to COVID, uh, so within, within, within uh, our locality, within Lanarkshire, uh, how we responded to COVID was, so we, we could see the kind of COVID thing taking shape. So the harm reduction team, we have, uh, we support 24 community pharmacy, IEP community pharmacies, who are providing injecting equipment, IEP. And we also have an outreach service. So what we, what we did uh, was we distributed uh, our outreach cards, so people would be able to access our outreach service. We have an outreach service. And people, uh, along with that, we supplied people with uh, pharmacies uh, with a community pharmacy map. So if people were unable to access injecting equipment for one pharmacy, they might be able to go to another pharmacy. And also the SDF uh, produced uh, guidance around uh, practices for people uh, during the COVID, the COVID outbreak. Uh, so these, this, this literature, as well as our community pharmacy IEPs, was also distributed to our addiction service, so the addiction recovery team in North Lanarkshire and the community addiction recovery service in South Lanarkshire, uh, and across the homeless uh, units and people supporting homeless people uh, in Lanarkshire. Uh, part of also that of the SDF's response to that, they became a, a source of collection of data uh, across the whole of Scotland. Uh, and the harm reduction team uh, uh, sit in the key informants meeting, which is monthly at the minute, and we feed into that, and that really provides SDF with a kind of overview about what's happening in the Lanarkshire. And they also have an online service uh, of the Scottish services uh, update that people can access as well, which will give people right up to date information about what's going on uh, locally. So, uh, where are we now with the testing? So, uh, Certainly within the NHS and within different services, there have been processes around uh, trying to re-establish services. So a real importance is about re-establishing our dry blood spot test and the facilities for people to get tested. So Trish, who's uh, chairing, the, chairing the meeting, submitted documentation to the Response Recovery Redesign and Oversight Group, or maybe the Rogue might be their phrase for it in Trish's mind, not too sure. Uh, and eventually the documents passed for re-establishment of dry blood spot testing and uh, the end of June or 30th of June. So on the back of that, so part of, so I'm not sure if people will be aware of that, but also, uh, so dry blood spot testing in Lanarkshire is processed at the West of Scotland Virology Centre in Glasgow. They also, the machine that does the hepatitis C testing is also the machine that is used for COVID. So we have a, we've agreed uh, there's been a bit of a restriction on the amount of tests we can submit. So at the minute, we're restricted to 30 or 40 dry blood spot tests from Lanarkshire. Uh, so due to capacity issues and monitoring that, the uh, harm reduction team are collating data on the amount of tests that are being carried out in Lanarkshire uh, and just keep keeping an eye on that uh, situation. Also, so we're, so we're, kind, of, we're kind of up and re-established and we're kind of doing testing again. A dry blood spot test in line. We're using all the PPE and requirements to keep people safe, but that, uh, that uh, process is happening again. 
So our colleagues uh, from Positive Support are also uh, carrying out dry blood spot tests. And I know Mark's going to talk about, about uh, Mark Simpson from Positive Support is going to talk about late, but a bit about it later. Who uh, they also uh, are doing uh, a couple of outreach workers, Eddie and Nicola, and they're doing point of care testing. Uh, and I'll talk a wee bit about that just in a wee minute. We also have a couple of GPs in Lanarkshire who have in their practice list to support a, a large number of people who are involved in opiate substitute prescribing. So they also are currently involved in testing as well. And we have just uh, run a social media campaign. So we've got an HIV uh, postal testing uh, service going on just now. And Trish is going to talk a wee bit about that uh, as well. So. So, so there's different types of tests going about. So you can see there, number one, venous blood sample. So that is really, that is the gold standard and it's probably what most people would be familiar with. So that's a sample of blood taken out of your vein. It's usually considered a clinical procedure. So it's generally kind of carried out by healthcare staff, usually in kind of healthcare settings. Uh, so that, that test is, is gold standard uh, and will test for H, HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C uh, altogether. Uh, the second, number two, is the dry blood spot test, which uh, is more widely available across Lanarkshire. It's not really considered a clinical procedure. It's quite accessible for people, uh, and there's more flexibility about it than the venous testing. Uh, so again, that, that, would, that would give results for hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and HIV. Uh, the third one there is a point of care test, but a rapid test some people would refer to. It to. So currently within uh, Lanarkshire, we have uh, a couple of outreach workers, Eddie and Nicola, as we were talking about earlier, who are using point of care tests. And the point of care tests will only test for HIV, but will give a, a rapid result. So people will get a result in roughly about 15 minutes. Uh, so it's, it's a really rapid result. People get a quick, res uh, quick, conf well, a quick result. Uh, the other part of that is it requires a venous confirmation test if that comes back positive. And we also have, as I said earlier, home postal test, home postal. Uh, HIV testing uh, going on just now, which can be requested through uh, Terence Higgins Trust and uh, also access, access through our uh, social media campaign. As I say, Trish is going to make some uh, reference to that as well. So frequency of testing. So a bit of a guideline. So uh, state an annual test is recommended for people who are injecting drugs. So we've got our ongoing HIV increase in Lanarkshire, and I suppose there's real concern about that lack of injecting equipment provision that has happened during the pandemic. Uh, so we, we would really like people to be tested uh, three three months if possible. So the kind of the people we would be looking for are people with the more at risk behaviours, I suppose. So people currently injecting, people at uh, increased risk through homelessness, uh, people who are injecting publicly. So it's maybe not as Public injecting is maybe not as prevalent as it is in Glasgow, but we have certainly pockets of public injecting happening in Lanarkshire. Uh, people are having sex without a condom or other preventions such as PrEP, and I know Leslie spoke about PrEP, and people who are travelling to Glasgow to buy or use drugs. So uh, we obviously border on to Glasgow, and we certainly, there is people moving back and forth uh, who are going to Glasgow to buy drugs. So, uh, so if, we, if uh, in the good old days when we were doing this face to face, we would have access to giving you out little cards with information on it. So, just at the start of this, uh, can you see those contact details at the bottom for North and South Lanarkshire? Answer contact numbers for our outreach phones. So, if you've got a pen and paper or you've got time while I'm talking here, it may be worth punching those numbers into your phone in case anybody's looking for some support. And I'll just talk a wee bit just now about what we do as a service. So we have our mobile outreach service. So our mobile outreach service uh, is a large uh, unmarked van. And really all the kind of things we do other than sexual health screening can be carried out uh, within the back of that van. Currently, obviously, within the pandemic situation, we're using PPE uh, and we're kind of ensuring that staff are safe and people using the service are safe as well. Uh, we offer safer injecting advice her around heroin injections, instead using uh, st uh, steroids or performing image and performance enhancing drugs and other drugs, as it says on the banner. And all, well, we have a, a the thing that's kind of been identified as driving this, some of the issues around this uh, HIV increase as stimulant injecting, as Leslie had mentioned earlier. So we will have conversations with people about uh, their injecting the cocaine. Uh, uh, so. The evidence is certainly in Lanarkshire, this is also quite prevalent as, as in Glasgow. So we also 
We have 24 I, uh, community pharmacy IAPs providing injecting equipment. So we have a dedicated worker who supports them and provides training around issues that may arise and ensures that uh, everybody is as safe as possible and injecting equipment is as accessible as possible. Uh, we have our outreach services previously, previously mentioned. Uh, so the injecting equipment we give out, uh, periodically we uh, receive some uh, Bad, uh, I suppose, advertising, if you want to phrase, where injecting equipment uh, will appear in public areas. However, we are really keen to get that back. We have a we have a public shop spin in North Lanarkshire, uh, so we're quite keen to get that back. And certainly, we have discussions with that about people. Uh, so we do testing for the BBVs. Uh, we also provide free condoms and provision of naloxone. Naloxone provision is another big issue for us. Uh, and we support people with uh, access and other services. We provide bits of training, so we are quite focused on overdose and naloxone training. We organise a safe injecting training with Kevin Flynn and recommend that to anybody that's interested in that. And we provide bits of training on BBV awareness. So this is my last my last slide. So testing services thin Lanark Shaft. So we have a uh, positive support who we'll talk about and Mark will talk a bit about that later on. Uh, we have Terence Higgins Trust, and as I kind of mentioned that, we've got our local addiction teams there, so addiction recovery team in the north, community addiction recovery team in the south, and as you can see the one below that, we've got the BBV Bloodborne Virus Service at Monklands Hospital, who can also support testing. Sexual health services, Panlanishire service, uh, so people can access testing there, and also uh, for people uh, accessing their GP services, Test for uh, HIV or bloodborne viruses can be accessed there. And that really rounds up my uh, 10 minutes. I might have run over slightly there, I'm not sure, Trish. Uh, well, uh, well, thanks for listening. That's fine, Ross. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, I think if people didn't know what the harm reduction team did uh, 15 minutes, 10 minutes ago, whatever it was, um, they certainly do now. And so that's a really thorough explanation of what the service provides. And I think also in terms of what's really been happening. A, and the impact of COVID on IEP services and, and provision services and how we've tried to respond and adapt to that as well. Um, the, the, there was only one, I suppose, really in terms of the, the, the last slide that you've put up there, what I will say as well, just to support uh, folk for, in terms of further information, uh, the very last slide of the last session will have the Lanarkshire HIV and Hepatitis website on it, and you, sh you will be able to, to access all of the testing services through the services section of that, which may be helpful for folk. And I wondered also if it was worth just mentioning, um, again, just some of the stuff that we're looking at at the moment. So the dry blood spot testing, given the central role that the, the harm reduction play uh, team play with regards to dry blood spot testing, we're looking to try and see if we can do that as a postal testing um, sort of scheme. Uh, just simply because of the restrictions that we've got around COVID. And I know that our colleagues in Grampian are already probably a step or so ahead of us, but that's something that we're, we're, we're looking to, to do as well. Yeah. So what I'm going to do now is, is thank, thank you again, Ross, and um, invite Maureen Wood um, on screen. And uh, we are going to take some Q&A. Okay, thanks, Trish. So we've had um, more comments and then questions, but there has been a valid point come up from Louise Pollock, our specialist um, BBV uh, midwife. So she's mentioned um, based on the routine antenatal screening is offered to all pregnant women um, when mm -hmm. they book for care. Early detection is vital to be able to undertake relevant management for women during pregnancy. They're referred to infectious diseases department to manage their infection. Maternity services provide antenatal care in conjunction with the service. The best evidence is to recommend formula milk. So it was a, the point about the breastfeeding, Leslie. Um, and um, NHS works with Waverly Care to provide free infant milk provision to women living with HIV to support women in terms of health benefits to baby, but also the financial cost of the formula, which can be around £13 a week. So I think that's a really va very valid comment. There's kind of one question, and it's probably, um, I'll direct it to Ross, if that's OK. And it's the time taken, Ross, during the COVID, you've mentioned about all the, the difficult um, issues and the lack of testing around bloodborne viruses. Um, but can you now, now that we're kind of back out testing again, can you maybe give us an idea how long it takes um, for the results to come if we're doing any testing, whether it be venous, yeah. um, blood? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Maureen. So, so currently, we would be looking for probably on a dry blood spot test too. Probably two to three weeks 
for the results to come back. So, and on a Venus test, so as we're doing, but we would be looking probably, so if people have an exposure to antibodies and they're carrying out the further PCR test, we'd probably be looking at two weeks. If they, if, if they have had no exposure to antibodies, we would probably have a Venus test result back in about a week. Um, so welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope that you, you're all suitably refreshed after that 10-minute that break. So this is the second half. We've just focused on testing and looked at HIV in a bit more detail and uh, spoke about the, the existing uh, HIV outbreak in Glasgow and how it's impacted on Lanarkshire as well. So we're now... We have focused on testing and treatment this morning, and we're going to get into it in a bit more detail, particularly the treatment part of, of HIV. But just to give you a, a bit of a, a very, very quick whistle-stop tour and brief overview of the HIV postal testing uh, scheme and social media uh, campaign that we, we ran in June and July. So in terms of uh, the social media campaign to promote the scheme. The scheme was a partnership with the Lanarkshire BVD Network and Terence Higgins Trust. Um, and so really, in a sense, the BVD Network developed the social media campaign. And in terms of the actual delivery end of the test, um, that was the, the, the Terence Higgins Trust's role uh, in the partnership. So the social media platforms that we've, we used, and we have used these platforms, we've ran probably about six or seven social media campaigns over the, over the last few years on HIV and on syphilis. And we've learned quite a lot about what works and what doesn't work or what seems to work best. And the platforms in terms of the platforms that we use, looking at specific target groups that we're trying to reach. And certainly Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and Scruff uh, are key platforms that we use this time round and all seem to work very successfully for us. Uh, Scruff is a platform, a social media platform that's used by um, gay and bisexual men. So in terms of the campaign creatives, so those are the platforms that we use, the creatives that we developed. And this was, again, a sort of three-way partnership, I suppose, with um, an external company called Elastic Creative, who have uh, provided us with some excellent campaigns in the past. The, so you, as you can see from the creative here, it focused around uh, this little prick, for want of a better expression. and um, and the, the finger prick element of the HIV self-testing kit. And really, I suppose in terms of the creative, and it was tested um, with a number of people prior to uh, sort of using uh, this particular creative, we felt it overall, it was humorous, it was engaging, um, it was fairly memorable. And if we, if we move out to the next slide, um, Sophie, we also felt what was really important and sometimes quite difficult to do in terms of creatives for campaigns, it was also inclusive. So we were able to cover you know, multiple races, genders, sexualities, et cetera, et cetera. And we were able to use it and be quite, you know, to, to adapt it for the different platforms that, that we used. So the next few slides are really just showing how it sat, thanks Sophie, how the, 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 the image and the messages within that uh, sat within each of the different um, social media platforms. So he, here you've got a screen grab of Facebook and Instagram ads. Uh, these are the Snapchat ads. And I think what's really important to understand is each of the messages focused on something slightly different. So one would perhaps have focused on the actual test itself, one focused on the, the postal nature of the scheme in terms of its confidentiality and the fact that it was fairly easy to do and it was just through the letterbox. And others focused on the importance, we've already stressed this today, but the importance of getting tested and getting on treatment and how significant that is to keeping an individual healthy, to keeping them safe, and indeed to, to reducing transmission, onward transmission to other people. Um, so if we, and one of, one of the, 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 the processes, one of the things that we've developed in the past First of all, which really what we found has worked always worked well, and we found this through trial and error, is when we use the word Lanarkshire in our social media campaign, it increases engagement because it makes it real for people. It's something to do with them about where they live. And it's 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 actually um more difficult for people to disengage from a message then if it's very much about the place that they live. So we found that that works well, which is why it was a Lanarkshire campaign. And the we develop a, what's called a landing page with a whole load of other information about HIV. 
and links to various you know condom schemes injecting equipment provision other bits of information that might be useful for folk and also if they then once they've read some of that or all of that they may think i really want to go for a test and then they would click on you can see just in, in the sort of left hand side there the order order yours today a uh, button and that would have taken them to the terence higgins trust uh, site so that they could order their test so in terms of the success of the campaign again these numbers are fairly reflective of some of the the campaigns that we've done in the past we would see this as being hugely successful with the uh, 180,000 video views and um over 6,000 6,500 total user engagements so that's clicks onto the site likes comments shares saves and I suppose the difference about this campaign compared to previous ones is we were actually able to see the the, the, the call to action, which is what's the sort of social media term, which is actually taking the step of ordering a test. So we're able to quantify that and look at some of the um, analytics and the information from each of those four social media sites to Terms Higgins Trust to see who moved into the campaign and moved out of the campaign and onto the Terms Higgins Trust uh, site and ordered a kit as well. And uh, Scruff certainly seemed to be, out of the 138 tests that were ordered, ordered, we know that 76 of those were men who had sex with men, and we're actually able to use the information to see the different demographic and types of people that who actually ordered a, a, a test kit. So really, in, in all, I suppose the, 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 the importance of, of that particular scheme was to, 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 to look at a way, we needed a way of increasing HIV testing because of the HIV situation. We did adapt elements of the campaign um, to be more suitable for people who perhaps didn't get access or didn't have access to social media and to um, tablets, etc., or computers. And we had a, po a poster and a card uh, that people could pick up in their local pharmacy as well. So it was adapted to look at the needs of other groups. Um, but all in all, we're, we're really pleased with the outcome of the campaign. And, you know, it does link very much to in trying to engage with individuals who've been at risk, get them tested, get them diagnosed, and then get them onto treatment. And the importance of HIV treatment in terms of prevention is so significant. So with that, I am delighted to see Leslie has joined us again. So I'm going to hand over to Leslie, who's going to take you through a short presentation about treatment and HIV. Over to you, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Trish, for having me back. So I'm going to just take you through a few slides, about seven slides in total, just about different aspects of treatment for HIV today um, in Scotland. So thank you, Sophie. <laughs> um, so first of all, what is the purpose of treatment for HIV? So treatment for HIV is called antiretroviral treatment. And some people will say ARV, for antiretroviral and some people say ART for antiretroviral treatment. They're the same thing, interchangeable. And ARVs, I will call them just now, are three different drugs um, which affect HIV at different parts of its life cycle, preventing the HIV virus from making copies of itself. And now those three different drugs will be combined into one or two tablets um, to be taken daily. And when we talk about taking the tablets daily, we that can sometimes be called adherence as well. So people adhere to their treatment. And there are many, many different combinations of treatment available. Those three different drugs and impacting, there's different options and they're combined into different treatment regimens. So you might be supporting someone um, or two people with HIV. So you might be, um, supporting people with HIV, but they're on different types of treatment. So just wanted you um, to know that that's absolutely fine. Um, and when people are on their treatment, the aim of treatment now is that people achieve their undetectable viral load. So that means that the virus has been made so low in the blood that they are unable to pass it on to their sexual partners and they're far less likely to transmit HIV through different routes of transmission as well, such as sharing injecting equipment. Okay, so th the next two slides, I've got these graphics with permission from the National AIDS Map. Um, definitely worth a look at their resources um, if you like these kind of cartoons and drawings. I like them for conveying messages. 
So when people living with HIV um, get blood tests, they get lots of different types of blood tests, but two really important ones to know are um, CD4 count, which CD4 cells are one of the most important cells of the immune system. And our immune system protects us against infections and illnesses. So the CD4 count tells you how many CD4 cells there are in a drop of blood. And the more there are of these, the better. It's essentially telling us how healthy our immune system is. Okay. The second blood test that people will get will be a viral load test. Viral load measures how many HIV, so how many virus particles there are in a drop of blood. And we want that number to be as low as possible. So by knowing these two numbers, the CD4 count, how healthy our immune system is, and also the viral load, how much is the virus replicating, we're able to see how good treatment is working. So when the CD4 count is low, the viral load will be come high and that's a situation that we do not want. That either means that someone's not on treatment or the treatment isn't working very effectively. When the CD4 count starts to become high and nice and healthy numbers and the viral load starts to go down, we know that treatment is being effective. So with sticking to the treatment, adhering to the treatment um, every day as prescribed, the CD4 count will stay nice, high, healthy and the viral load will go down and should eventually go down to undetectable levels, so low that the blood test cannot detect it. Again, it is not a cure. The per if the person stops taking treatment, the viral load will come up and the CD4 count will go down again. So when people get their undetectable viral load, they must continue to take treatment. So that's why treatment's really important. But another aspect is, well, what happens if people do not take treatment? So my next slide, Sophie, is going to show this. So apologies, this can look a little bit um, confusing at first, but we're going to work our way through it. So along the x-axis at the bottom, you're going to see that we've got one, two, and three months. So that first um, couple of months after someone's been infected, and then there's a bit of a line and then we're into years. Those years are typically nine to 12 years by the end of the x-axis there. And then the y-axis we have low, so going to undetectable levels and then high, so the highest level. So the blue line there shows us the viral load. That's how much virus is in the body. Now we can see that those first three months, the viral load, goes up and it actually goes up to its highest possible, its highest ever numbers, it's in the millions. HIV is replicating lots and lots and lots and lots. This is when people are at their actual most infectious. But they're typically not diagnosed during this time either. And the activity, whether it's the sex that they are having or it's the sharing of injecting equipment that they're doing for using their drugs that got them infected with HIV, they're typically or maybe still doing those activities as well. So not only have they become infected with HIV and they're living with HIV with very high numbers, they're potentially passing HIV, not knowing they are doing so onto other people. So that is why when we say repeat three monthly testing, it's very, very important because if we wait a year, in between tests when there's high levels of HIV transmission amongst populations, we're going to miss people and there's going to be more onward transmission. So you can see then the green line is the CD4 count. That's how healthy our immune system is. Now remember this is without treatment. So our immune system is quite nice, high and healthy, but during those first three months when the viral load comes up, we get a dip in our immune system count, our immune system cells. And that we call that at the time zero conversion. Um, and the immune system is just really trying to figure out what's going on. This new virus has entered the body. It's also using our cells. So the immune system has to adapt to this new virus in the body. And it learns that over a couple of months. And then the immune system cells start to take a bit of control. And the viral load comes down. Not right down to undetectable levels during these years that precede the person can still onward transmit HIV to others. It's just not as high as during those first few months. And this can go on for, as I said, nine to 12 years. 
and eventually as the HIV virus is replicating and using our immune system cells, the virus is going to overtake the immune system. The CD4 count is going to become very, very low and that is when we get other infections or other cancers, fungal infections, bacterial infections, certain cancers that are the defining AIDS type illness, um, acquired immune deficiency syndromes, those illnesses that define um, being diagnosed with AIDS. And that's when we're talking about end of life. So hopefully that makes sense about one, why three monthly testing is really important, but also why access to treatment is really important as well. So ART or ARV, antiretroviral treatment. This is the medication that people who are diagnosed with HIV take. We would hope that people would get, once they're diagnosed, that they would get access to their antiretroviral straight away, you know, within a day, within a couple of days, but definitely as soon as possible. So treatment stops HIV making copies of itself. This keeps the amount of virus in the body low and it protects the immune system. So it keeps the individual's immune system healthy, keeps that person safe, but by reducing the amount of virus in the person, it's preventing onward transmission. We can also call that treatment as prevention as well. So by keeping the amount of HIV in the body low, antiretroviral treatment also reduces the risk of HIV being passed on. People living with HIV who take their treatment as prescribed will and hopefully now will achieve their undetectable viral load. U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable. And this is when the HIV in the body is reduced to such low levels, can't be detected by the lab test anymore, and that's unable to be passed on through sex. So this is now where we are talking about these two treatments that I mentioned earlier on, the preventative treatments. So PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. Prophylaxis means preventative treatment. Post-exposure, you think you've been exposed to HIV, there's a treatment that you can take that will prevent you from becoming HIV positive. That's living with HIV. So PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, is a treatment that can stop HIV infection after the virus has entered the body. And it has to be taken within 72 hours of exposure. And you would take it for exactly as instructed for 28 days. So the types of situations that this might mean are, for example, uh, occupational exposure, a needle stick injury. Um, it could be a sexual assault, a rape. Um, PEP could be used in that situation. Or it could be that you know that you've, um, you're having sex with someone, you know they've got detectable HIV, you're using a condom, but the condom breaks. So these are all types of situations that you could go to either a sexual health clinic or out of hours at a and &E, and the person that you meet will then do an assessment of risk with you. If it's deemed that you've been at high risk of the sexual exposure to HIV or the occupational exposure of HIV through, say, a needle stick injury, you could be pre um, prescribed PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, now, sometimes as well, I like to use the analogy sometimes to think about PEP as um, similar to the morning after pill, something happens and after the effect, you take something that prevents you from becoming HIV um, positive. So post-exposure prophylaxis you take after being exposed. Pre-exposure prophylaxis is medication that you take before you become exposed. So some people are aware or are informed that they are at the highest risk of sexual exposure um, of HIV. So this could be men who have sex with men, sex workers, for example. There's quite a few different um, categories and the web address at the bottom there can talk you through those. So this is medication that people typically take every single day when they are HIV negative. There is then enough HIV medication within their system that if they did get um, HIV enter their body, the medication would prevent them from becoming HIV positive. It is currently only available at specialist PrEP clinics and sexual health clinics. And before you get access to PrEP, um, you will have to have an HIV test to show that you're HIV negative and a full STI screening. You'll then get prescribed PrEP for three months. And then when, if you wanted to continue on PrEP, you would go back to the clinic and you would have another HIV and full STI screening as well. 
Um, so most people in Scotland, this is available on the NHS in Scotland, huge advancement in the last couple of years, another tool in our HIV prevention, which is a medication, it's amazing. Most people in Scotland who take PrEP will, def um, will be men who have sex with men, so definitely more work to be done to encourage and to let women at risk um, know and other people at risk, for example, injection drug users who are also having um, sex as well, that PrEP is something that's available and it could be used to prevent them from getting HIV. So thank you, Trish. Thank you, Leslie. And again, another impressive uh, presentation and making something that for many people can maybe be quite complicated and difficult to understand, but you've really managed to make it really quite oh, clear for Final point about just using that analogy of PEP is like the morning after pill. PrEP could be thought of as like the contraceptive pill. And so quite and often use that analogy to explain it. Yeah, Thanks, Trish. And I think I think what's really important as well in terms of people to and you, you've stressed this already in terms of your previous presentation. Um the, you know the import the importance again of treatment and prevention. Um, and the fact that we're now, we're even a step further that we're actually using HIV treatment for people who are HIV negative. I mean, we really have come a very, very long way in terms of how we can actually respond to the whole issue of HIV. So again, no doubt there will be um, uh, plenty of questions coming through and comments coming through, but we're going to move on now. So thank you very much. You'll come back in a moment uh, uh, for, the, for the question section. Um, and I'm gonna hand over now to Maureen Woods, who you've seen very briefly during the question and answer session. And Maureen is going to take us through some information to do with the Lanarkshire BBV Clinical Treatment Services. Um, Maureen, I'm just going to hand straight over to you. Off you go. Hi, good afternoon again. Um, so I'm here on behalf of um, Sharon Woods, um, who's currently on holiday, um, speaking on behalf of the BBV um, Treatment Service. So just to point out that the BBB service is uh, based at Monklands. Um, the main consultants there are Dr. Nick Kennedy, who's the executive lead, Dr. Anne Chapman, Dr. Stephanie Dundas, Dr. Claire McGoldrick and Dr. Katie Sykes. Alongside the, the doctors um, is uh, Sharon Woods, who's the team leader for the team, and Alison Blue, um, one of the uh, charge nurses, and Jacqueline Bonner. So they currently run um, clinics both within the, the service at Monklands and um, have set up, set up outreach clinics throughout Lanarkshire. Um, there is also uh, services available at Hare Myers. So really, it's been a really challenging time for everybody during this um, COVID situation. So um, Sharon has indicated that whilst all clinical, well, all routine HIV clinics were cancelled and have been cancelled since, since March, Anyone who um, clinically indicated that they required an HIV test, the testing did continue throughout the, all the sites anyway. Um, what she has also mentioned here is that um, they did diagnose some new patients during lockdown, so the consultants were able, able to continue to see new and urgent patients and get them assessed and started on treatment um, as quickly as they could. So the BBB unit has a contract with Lloyd's Home Care for Home Delivery of HIV medication. However, just less than half of the patients do not receive that service. Um, the reasons indicated would be the patient's choice, the recent diagnosis, um, recently switched medications, patient assessed as unsuitable for home care. Um, so home care stopped accepting new patients at the start of lockdown. However, the team continued to do urgent and essential blood tests. So they do that via domiciliary visits um, using full PPE um, to take bloods for monitoring. And they also delivered where they could HIV medication to around 110 patients not on home care delivery. So the service continued um, throughout um, it's an essential um, part of the work. They also continued to offer self-referral for, for BBV um, testing as well. So what they're hoping um, from now um, taking it forward, they are hoping to restart the clinics in September. Um, Trish has already mentioned that nobody can really restart clinics until approval from the Redesign and Recovery Oversight Board. Um, and it must be, they must they have to look at a mixture of virtual and face-to-face -face clinics as well. There's obviously restrictions within the clinic due to social distance and they've got quite limited space over at the BBV unit and obviously within the clinical space um, allocated. 
um, we are aiming to do less blood tests um, for stable patients. So some can be done annually um, instead of the six monthly routine. And obviously review routine investigations that they currently do, and um, they do reduce these while continuing to meet with the, the BEVA, the British HIV Association standards. So at the moment, mainly domiciliary visits um, and the are aiming to establish the community HIV clinic in South Lanarkshire as, as soon as they can. Still waiting on permissions to get clinical space within health centres, um, but with the difficulty before COVID, but more difficult due to the restrictions in the waiting area. So that's all the information, Sharon. I've, I can conclude the um, presentation on behalf of the BBV unit. Thanks very much, Maureen. That's, uh, that's very helpful. And they are such an important service for us in terms of um, some of the developments that have been happening as well in relation to trying to develop HIV clinics in the community. So the, the, the Hep C clinics clearly have been long established in terms of outreach clinics in the community. And looking what we're looking at now is perhaps looking at trying to develop BBV clinics. Because really, in a sense, it's much of the same target group that we're looking at, uh, particularly with regards to the, the HIV risks that are out there for injecting drug users. So thank you very much for the overview. And without, uh, we'll see you in a minute for the for the questions. Um, so you. without further ado, I'm delighted to, to hand over to Mark Simpson, um, who is who's going to take us through um, you know, a detailed look at what the, what the positive support service provides for us in Lanarkshire. Again, <coughs> one of their key services. So over to you, Mark. We'll see you in a Thanks, moment Tish. for the question. Okay, bye Thanks, then. Tish. <clears throat> yeah, my name is Mark Simpson. Um, I'm the team leader for Positive Support Lanarkshire. Um, just to, a, a quick overview of the service. Um, we, we, are, we work with people who um, are living with hepatitis C and support individuals with HIV among people who inject drugs. Um, basically, what we do is we, we, we support individuals to get access treatment at the hospitals. Um, we take them to all their appointments at the hospital, we'll bring them back home just to make sure they can get through their treatment. We've been doing that now for, a, for about seven or eight years um, in, in Lanarkshire. Uh, we support them with, with other individual uh, needs that they may have as well, you know, benefits and, and housing and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> there, there's myself and, and Jackie and, and Lauren who work in the service. Um, and and our, our main aim is obviously to also to uh, re reduce the prevention um, a bloodborne viruses within Lanarkshire. That's just a wee quick overview of, of what we do in um, supporting people. Uh, we also do the referral um, in the hospitals and referrals to harm reduction teams for further testing. Um, and, and we also do testing opportunistically to individuals who you know maybe the family members which require a test. Um, and we can test them um, when, when we're working with these individuals. That's basically just a wee overview of what we do um, in Lanarkshire. That's the contact details of our office. Um, and their email addresses and phone numbers. Um, <clears throat> if you want to, I'll, I'll leave it there for a wee second or two, if you can maybe jot even one of the numbers down and um, all the email addresses are the same, just the names are different. Um, and feel free to contact us at any time. We take self-referrals referrals off of anybody. Um, uh, we, we also have, um, we, we received a bit of funding last year from the Bloodborne Virus Networks and the North and South uh, Lancashire ADPs. Um, to, to try and create a, an asset about each project. Um, we have Eddie and Nicola who, who deliver that, and what they do is we don't look at as, as people who are hard to reach. We look at as people who are hard to engage. We can always reach them. And the best way to reach these people is, is to get people in the community. And, and what we do is we have a few volunteers, and we're building up a volunteer network across Lanarkshire in the communities, because um, these are the people that know the people. Um, and these are the people who get us access to the people who are, are no in services, um, they're, they're maybe unknown to services, or maybe they are known to services and, and they're disengaged. And, and we also deliver um, the, the HIV point of care testing in there as well. <clears throat> a lot of people can be asked. The reason why a lot of people like this is because you know, limited access to services, maybe where they live. Um, a lot of people live in rural areas like Carn Wath or, or maybe out in Glen Boy, get away up in Plains and Airdrie, they find it quite difficult to get down to services. Um, so, so what Eddie and Nicola do is they go there and, and try and get these people in. We've got a lot of people who have been drug users, no in services. We've got them into services um, and, and they've been seen by the, the CARES worker or the ART worker and they've been put on scripts and we're working them with them. We, we continue to work with them um, and, and get them stabilised and they seem to have a wee better outlook in life and a bit of hope that you know, maybe they can change their life. So Eddie and Nicola just continue to work with them. 
um, in the communities. <coughs> also, as well, as I say, we do the, we're doing the point of care testing now, um, which is working quite well, and uh, we're doing a lot of HIV point of care testing. What we'll do there is, if we get into it, it's positive, we will then refer them to the harm reduction team. The harm reduction team will go out and see them and see if there are any further testing needing done. So we do quite a lot of work with the harm reduction team uh, doing this. Uh, that, that again there is uh, the contact details. And while you're looking at that, I'm just going to show you. Uh, I've, I've got a minute left, and I'm just going to show you a quick point of care test. And it comes in a box like this here. Um, and what you do is you take off the, the little prick and you prick a finger. You give it a squeeze. You touch that. It sucks up the blood. You take the pot off the top. Sit it in there. Sit, sit it in there, and that's you. You wait 10, 15 minutes later. One line for negative, two lines for positive. Very easy, very simple. And this is the same as the postal, the postal service as well. You, you get this with the postal service. So it's a very simple, quick, um, and easy uh, test. You put it in the, the disposable bag, um, seal it up, and uh, dispose of it uh, responsibly, like you would um, anything else. Um, <clears throat> so as I said, no, uh, anything that uh, you can contact us at any time. Anybody can contact us, and we'll gladly come out and speak to you. Um, so I just hope that was a wee bit helpful there, and uh, just a quick overview, you know, just due to your time. But thanks anyway for listening. I appreciate that. Oh, Mark, thank you very much for that, and I, and I really uh, enjoyed very much the fact that you added that into the end there, because I think what's important, and you've stressed it, and others have stressed it today, is this normalising testing and trying to trying to explain and, and and clarify how simple it can be to actually take a test. But we all know. I think, I think even from the postal testing, what's been really interesting is that the amount of individuals who had never tested before was quite significant. So that that test that you've just shown us there, clearly from the experience that we've had, even just in terms of the, the, the postal testing, and I know that you're experiencing this with the outreach service as well, people are seeing how easy it is, how simple it is. And yeah. actually, once somebody takes their first HIV test, then taking the next HIV test will be that bit simpler. Yeah. So it's about trying to make it easy, take down the barriers, make it as normal as yeah. possible. Just like any other test you would take for any other condition. Yeah. And I think that hopefully that's something that we, we, we can stress today and that pe that's one of the, the key messages that people will yeah. take away. So thank you very much for giving yeah. us the overview. Yeah. And I, I, just think think well, I just think as well that Eddie and Nicola go out with these blue hoodies on in the community. So they're quite well recognised and very approachable. So they're easy yeah. to see in the community. That's great, thank you. So I'm going to take the executive decision to uh, <laughs> to close the session today. Um, and really, just so now that we've come to the end of today's webinar, I think uh, Leslie mentioned this earlier on, but it, it is important that we're able to use today's shared learning and experience to improve our understanding of practice and ultimately what we do with our service users. Um, around messages and prevention and, and signposting to services that, that hopefully you're aware of now if you weren't before. So please do share what you've learned today um, within your services with other colleagues. And also with that in mind, just a reminder that today's session has actually been recorded and will be published on the SDF YouTube channel. So again, another opportunity for you and others to watch today's presentations and discussions. Uh, I would recommend also that you take the opportunity <coughs> to these webinars uh, delivered during coronavirus pandemic um, held by SDF on their YouTube channel. Uh, they're very, very good. And an evaluation will be forwarded to you, which we'd appreciate if you could you could complete. And it, it helps us to improve what we do for next time. This is the first time we've held this, so there's certainly going to be learning from it. So finally, I would like to thank, and a special thanks, of course, to our speakers, uh, Leslie Bond, Ross Miller, Maureen Woods, Mark Simpson, and not forgetting behind the scenes and keeping us all on our toes today, Sophie Milton from SDF for her technical expertise and support. So thank you once again for your attendance today. Please do enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope you're able to join us again at future briefings. Uh, good afternoon and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.